Well, welcome everyone um, to tonight's event, uh, Material of the Vessel uh, panel discussion. Um, I'd like to start with a little housekeeping. Um, please remain muted during the talk. And if you have questions, um, add them to the chat. Um, I am starting the um, subtitles. So if you want to go ahead and access those, um, depending on your device, it's usually a little box with a CC in it. Go ahead and click on that and you will have um, subtitles for this event. Um, I would like to acknowledge that the Center for Art and Wood is located on the land of the Lenni Lenape Nation. We honor those steward, um, those who steward these unceded uh, lands, past, present, and future. Um, to learn more about the Lenni Lenape, please uh, visit the following links in the chat, which I will add shortly. Um, so thank you again for joining us for Material of the Vessel, a panel discussion that is inspired by our current exhibition um, that will be up on view through February 14th. And I will also add a link in the chat for that exhibition. Um, this evening, we've invited curators from um, the nation's leading material focused museums to share their thoughts on vessels and their importance to art in the past, present, and future. And I'd like to welcome this evening's moderator, Emily Zilber. Hi, Emily. Uh, Emily Zilber's work directly supports contemporary art and artists, especially those whose practices intersect with craft and design. She is the Director of Curatorial Affairs and Strategic Partnerships at the Wharton Eshrick Museum, where she facilitates um, conversations between contemporary artists and Eshrick's legacy. Adjunct faculty at Tyler School of Art and Architecture and maintains an independent consulting and coaching practice. So she's very busy. Um, as guest curator at the Renwick Gallery of Smithsonian American Art Museum from 2020 to 2021, she organized the Invitational Exhibition Forces of Nature and is accompanying catalog. Zilber spent almost a decade at the first Warnock cure, cure as the first Warnock Curator of Contemporary Decorative Arts at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, where she built an integrated um, curatorial program for craft and design within the museum's contemporary art department. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to Emily. Thank you, Katie. Um, it's so great to be here with all of you tonight. I wanna to thank uh, Nava, Katie, and the center for inviting me to moderate a panel with some of the best and brightest minds in our field. Um, it's just wonderful to see their faces and yours. Um, I was lucky enough to see the exhibition that's bringing us together before the holidays. I encourage everyone who's on the panel tonight uh, to check it out if you can before it closes in a couple of weeks because it is just that good. So congratulations, Nava, on a spectacular show. Um, I'm so thrilled to be here with these colleagues to talk about the ideas and possibilities that the vessel form contains and its importance to art making past, present, and future. For tonight's program, I'll ask each of the panelists that we have here. Um, we're lucky enough to have Carissa Hassong from the Metal Museum, Susie Silbert from the Corning Museum of Glass, Nava Milliken from the Center for Art in Wood and our the exhibition's curator, and Jennifer Zwilling from the Clay Studio, if everyone just wants to give a little wave. Um, I'll ask them each to give an introduction to who they are, the work that they do, We'll delve into conversation and then we'll leave about 10 minutes before the close of the, the conversation tonight for questions from you. We'd love to, to break this open into conversation at the end. We'll, we hope that you'll, you'll have some, some ideas and thoughts to share with us. So without further ado, I wanna ask our panelists to share a little bit about themselves and their work. Um, who wants to go first for an introduction? Maybe, Nava, should we start with you since, since this is your show? 
Thanks, Emily. Sure, I'll, I'll go first. Um, my name is Nava Milliken. I am the Executive Director and Chief Curator of the Center for Art in Wood. Um, and I have been here for a little over four years um, and have been privileged during the time that I've been here to um, have wide artistic freedom to think about the material of wood and creative engagement in it. Um, and um, I'll just briefly say that this exhibition came about um, as a result of a couple of things. First of all, um, it was a chance to kind of reach back into the early um, history and ideas of the Center for Art and Wood, which is originally called the Wood Turning Center. Um, and it allowed us to profile some, some works in the collection um, and integrate those with works that are lo on loan from artists. Um, it also allowed me to bring to Philadelphia work that I had first um, seen in Seattle a few years ago um, when I was a curator at Belly of the Arts Museum. And since the first day that I was in my position here, I said to myself, I am bringing Aaron Haba's vessel to this space. It has to be in this space. And so the exhibition really developed around those two ideas, um, how to celebrate wood turning and its alignment with contemporary art and the mission of this um, organization, how to bring in really spectacular works that um, defy our perceptions or understandings of vessels in terms of size, scale, and material. And then also to encourage um, our visitors to think beyond the sort of practicality of the vessel um, and its accompaniment in our daily lives. Um, how do we think of it also as um, a spiritual form, um, a mimetic form, and um, how do we also align it with discussions of our bodies um, and our authority and agency over our own bodies? So those were the ideas behind the show and it all came together and I'm really thrilled that it um, allowed us to come together today. Fabulous, thank you, Nava. Does anyone want to introduce themselves next? What about you, Jen? You're in my, in my eyesight. <laughs> oh, and I think you might still be muted. Not like I've been Zooming for three years or anything. Um, <laughs> hi. First, I want to congratulate Nava for a just beautiful show. It's stunning and you really feel a visceral connection to the pieces when you walk into the space because of that alignment with the body, which is what we're all looking for as curators. I think when um, people enter our space and have kind of a bodily reaction, but that's what I'm looking for. <laughs> um, and also Katie, of course, and everyone at the center because it's a group, it is always a group effort. I am the curator and director of artistic programs at the Clay Studio here in Philadelphia. Um, I've been, I've been at the Clay Studio for eight years, which sounds crazy to me. Um, I was uh, an assistant curator in American Decorative Arts at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Before that, I taught the history of craft for about 10 years at Tyler School of Art. I developed the class and was privileged to get to teach a two semester long craft survey course. Um, to students of, of craft materials. That was amazing. I am still um, teaching occasionally at Tyler, which is great. I think it's important to stay connected to students. My role at the Clay Studio, um, as for many of us on this call, I wear many hats. I am um, in charge of the exhibition programs, the resident artist program. We have about 12 resident artists. Um, I think probably most people on the call know, but the Clay Studio has been around since 1974, and our resident artists are kind of this, the um, outgrowth of those first five founders of the pro program that just needed some shared studio space and enjoyed community. Um, I also oversee our permanent collection, which for the first time ever is out on display. We have a brand new building that opened in April that I hope everyone will come and see and instead of in dusty boxes in the basement, the collection is out on view, which is really exciting. 
And we just opened Figuring Space, um, an exhibition of 12 figural human-sized figure sculptures um, by artists around the country. And it really couldn't align better with this idea of um, what does it mean to make a vessel? So I'm really excited to talk and of course, honored to be in this great company. So thanks. Thank you, Jen. Um, Krista, would you like to share a little bit more about you yourself and your work? Thank you. I just wanted to say thank you first for including me in this panel discussion. It's definitely giving me a lot to think about. And I'm sorry I'm not going to see the show in person, but the images are amazing. Um, but thank you. I um, am Carissa Husong. I'm the executive director at the Metal Museum. I have been here 15 years now. If you're not familiar with the museum, we do have a focus on the art and craft to find metal work. We are not only a museum, um, with a collection, but we also have a blacksmith shop, a foundry, and a small metal studio here on the grounds. And so we are able to sort of introduce people to um, everything from making to um, appreciating the final object. We are in a major growth period, and Jen, I hope that I will be um, welcoming everybody to our new facility in a couple of years, but we are making them, we're in the middle of a huge um, capital campaign and expansion. It feels like I'm kind of creating a new vessel to hold more vessels, oh. um, but it's, it's a, <laughs> a great opportunity to really expand what we're doing and bring a greater audience to our programming. Fabulous. Thank you, Carissa. And last, but but by no means least, Susie, would you would you share a little bit about yourself with, with yes. the group? I would be I would love to. Um, I am so <laughs> excited to be here with all of you tonight. Um, many people I know and uh, people I don't know. And on the panel, I feel like it's old home week. So that's very cool. Um, Susie Silbert, I am uh, currently the curator of post-war and contemporary glass at the Corning Museum of Glass where I've been for the last seven years. And um, like many of the other folks that spoke, uh, the Corning Museum of Glass is a place of um, exhibiting, has an incredible collection, wildly amazing um, collection of primarily vessels, although the part I oversee is less vessels, um, from the beginning of glass time 35 centuries ago to the present day. Um, but it's also a place of making um, and a, a, a real, um, uh, a convening place, the same way that vessels maybe could be a tool of convening um, for a variety of different people and um, different communities. And before I came here, I, um, I did a number of things, including I lived at the Penland School of Crafts for four years, where um, maybe don't tell my bosses, but I worked in other materials besides glass and worked with other folks besides glass. And I've even done things with the Center for Art and Wood. And um, anyway, I'm so thrilled to be here and be talking about this um, very exciting uh, topic tonight. So thank you all for being here and for the opportunity. Well, so we've got, we've got a stacked panel <laughs> and we're gonna start with a, a question that is deceptively simple. Um, how do you define what a vessel is? What makes a vessel a vessel? Does anyone want to take that first? Or should I should I pinpoint somebody? <laughs> I saw I don't know. I was Jennifer actually going to say, is it unfair to keep asking Nob and go first? Because, um, <laughs> um, well, I'll just say the thing that is the first thing, which is it's got to hold. It, it is something that holds something. But then of course it can be something that doesn't hold something to <laughs> um, I, I guess um, when I started thinking about these questions and given the connection between the vessel show at the center and the figure show, um, I was really thinking a lot about the human body connection um, and that the the necessity of a vessel is is something that not only echoes our own bodies, but is essentially what allowed civilization to exist. So how how visceral and how um, basic this idea is 
is, it's, I mean, it's hard to, to even say it out loud because it's so obvious. So you're welcome everyone for me stumbling through starting the conversation. I'm gonna step back and maybe come back in later while someone else takes it. I would add to that, I, I mean, containment is the first and foremost principle of vessel. Uh, but I think in most cases, vessels are also transportable um, they allow us not only to hold things, but also move things from place to place. Um, so I think the mobility of a vessel is, is part of what makes it so easy to, to think of ourselves as vessels and our brains as vessels for memory. And, um, and then in um, many, many cultures around the world, there is a whole um, understanding of the afterlife and how we get from this vessel um, and and the, the ephemera that makes us who we are, how that gets passed from one vessel to the other, um, to the next life or the next realm. And um, so that's what I would add to the list of what makes a vessel. I think I might just jump back in for one second because I feel like that maybe I wasn't, um, I love what Nava just said about in afterlife and maybe if I was being totally honest what I would have said before was um that one of the first things I think about is childbirth mm -hmm. um having you know anyone who's been through it for sure but even you know our our deep understanding of it even for those of us humans who haven't gone through that experience is um the 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 connection between yourself as a vessel and an object is um, again, something that's gonna, I don't know, which is I think maybe why when I walk into the, the exhibition, I have that, that visceral connection. Anyway, Susie looked like she was gonna talk. And I... I am in a totally different direction. I'm like, <laughs> you know, and I just had a baby, um, but- but I'm thinking that too. But, um, what I, I was thinking when you were first speaking and um, is this very different direction than how I had been thinking before we got on the call. But I was thinking about um, th thinking about what Jennifer and Nava both said and thinking about the vessel as also something that is enabled, not just transport, but it's enabled um, whole uh, economies and, and exchanges. And so thinking about, I immediately think like I love shipwreck stuff. You know, I think about those giant amphora, just giant. And think about the scale of uh, Roman and pre-Roman um, movement of, of things. But then also to think about, uh, to, to think about the relationship between vessels, the body, like uh, obviously what they're containing is food, right? And we want those vessels because we want the food and we want the food that those guys over there make. And I really understand that because I live in Corning, New York, you know, so I'm like, oh, send me the good things um, from somewhere else. But I, I was also thinking about in the history of glass blowing or of glass working, you know, there was 1500 at least years when there was glass making before there was glass blowing. And in those, in the time before glass blowing, there were glass vessels and they were privileged special objects for privileged special things like maybe for makeup. Mm -hmm. But within the fifth, first 50 years of glass blowing, all of a sudden, there were all the things that we use glass for today, the windows and all of that, but also big, big storage containers for food. And they were so ubiquitous that they would be through all strata of society. But sort of just like Nava was saying, in a less metaphysical sense of moving the stuff of a person from one vessel to the, the vessel of the next life, um, you know, the Romans used those blown glass vessels as repositories for remains. You know, people were buried in them because the vessel, uh, of course, we put ourselves um, in 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 another carrier for um, for the rest of eternity, um, or until a museum digs it up and puts it in the permanent collection. <laughs> well, I kind of thought you were going to go in the direction of vessels moving people, and I was thinking about exploration as being another way that it's a, you know given us a way to. Um, advance, create, connect, and discover our world. I love that we've gone very quickly to thinking about how vessels make culture 
as a part of their inherent qualities. And it kind of brings me to um, this question around, um, there's an anthropologist, Elizabeth Fisher, um, who was writing in the 70s and 80s, who developed this carrier theory of evolution. So positing that the first cultural device was probably a recipient, such as a pouch, a net, a bag, rather than some kind of implement of violence, so like a spear. And I'm curious if we can kind of dig a little deeper into this idea about culture starting with the vessel instead of the weapon. What does that mean for us as people and as artists for the way that we engage with this form? That makes me think about, um, <clears throat> I think Susie said in her introduction that the vessel is a tool of convening and it is when we can gather and eat together that we are convening and that that is when you started talking about, um, you know, vessels and carrying nets and things rather than weapons. Does that remind us or tell us that humans we we are more hope, hopefully can we think about ourselves more as convening and eating together and being together and forming culture first before there was war that's kind mm. of comforting can i ask a can i ask a question a follow up well this one you know of course the clay person says that <laughs> that vessels are all for getting together and eating together and i see you know i can get behind a, a cup uh, a tumbler and obviously there are um food where made in the other materials y'all represent but i wanted to know nava and carissa do you see it the same way or is there a gift of um wood and metal vessels that that operates in a in a different way um, with this culture idea that Emily brought up. I mean, I think I think when we talk about wood and histories of vessels and and uh, we can really talk about um, differences of scale. We could talk about ships um, and um, and uh, Carissa's note about exploration and travel and um, and that then facilitates a different kind of communion with people who might speak a different language or have different customs and and um, um, need and and rituals and mythologies and um, and so that that kind of um, meeting point um, can facilitate a development of culture in different ways. But then when I was thinking about this talk today, I was also thinking about um, the uh, tradition of treenware, which are um, handmade wooden tabletop items, everything from like carved cups, which were common before the ability to produce cheap goods out of metal that then superseded handmade um, wooden objects. And, um, and the ways that um, Native Americans would make these objects out of um, burl woods because they like the pattern and the marbling, but you also you couldn't do that in Europe because you needed old growth forests in order to cultivate you know, to have the burl to access as a raw material. Um, and the ways that then European settlers came here, received these vessels as gifts, and then learned how to make them um, from the burls they would encounter in the forest. So I, I guess um, in a rambling way, <laughs> I'm sort of thinking about how these things are passed around um, and then shared and stolen also. Vessel to vessel. And of course, I can't help thinking about just all of the religious objects, metal objects, um, just that whole history of um, ritual and tradition and in some ways maybe um, decadence within it, but certainly there is that, again, that sense of spirituality and tradition that goes with metal vessels. What, what I hear in this commonality between all of your answers, right, is that the things that we find important, the things that we value, the things that we wanna hold on to we, whether it's connection, whether it's spirituality, like we make, we make vessels for those. 
we try to contain those in some way. And so I'm curious if knowing this and thinking about the function of the vessel as this container for what we value, um, can it do things in the context of art making that other forms can't? I keep being the first one, I'm sorry. So I'm <laughs> no, please jump <laughs> in. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I was just writing down when, when you said that, um, the idea that we are one of the earliest forms of art making was was ornamenting yourself right making jewelry or doing something to yourself well it wasn't too far a step to then start ornamenting your vessels and so of course you have when when hunting and gathering was what you needed to do and you needed something to put the things that you gathered into a vessel you were making the vessels that way however you could and then you know early agriculture as well like you could create a farm and, and do agriculture because you had places to store things um so those things were a representation of your body because if you had a store of food it meant your body could be nourished from that store of food so of course the instinct that we would decorate something immediately close to us that we could carry around with us our body and then the next thing is the vessel that is what's allowing us to stay alive. Nav, I see you nodding vigorously. <laughs> I mean, for a number of reasons, but first of all, just, just that um, how um, Jen elegantly brought up the idea of ornamentation being um, and, and the focus on and the value of um, the way that essential objects were valued in societies that were able to then show wealth or status. Um, and also uh, convey and communicate their narratives um, through ornamentation is an essential part of the thinking of this show too. Um, and um, so I'm so glad that you brought that up. Um, but I, I also, um, this reminds me of why I got into the, to thinking about um, craft and design in the contemporary context in the first place 20 years ago when I was at the Museum of Art and Design um, in New York, um, because it was the first time as a, as a young sort of naive, but very conventionally trained art history graduate. Um, it was the first time that I'd encountered objects that had a functional history in the museum context. And I got so excited about all of the ways that objects that have these codes, these like ancient codes that's anyone walking into space in an exhibition or a gallery can immediately mentally enter in the same way with the same kind of understanding and the potential that that invites, um, the way that invites an artist to use that code and then subvert it in a way and use it for whatever political message or personal message or societal discussion or, you know, and in any number of ways to charge that initial recognizable code. Um, it seemed such a powerful way of connecting um, our connections as societies and our, the way that people connect with our ancient history in decorative arts with the present and our contemporary existence. So that's why I'm still here. All about that. So that yeah, the vessel, the vessel allowed you to see how people could find a way into to what you were, the work you were doing as a curator. Well, I think it was the other way around. I I felt or like the other way around. Yeah, opportunity for a curator to to look at work that artists were doing or encourage artists to to see things this way, and then and then to tell stories in an exhibition space with these objects that were connected by like really essential messages. And Susie or Carissa, any any thoughts? I do, but I'm trying to to. Um not be so extroverted and make sure <laughs> I'm, make sure Carissa you have an opportunity before I, I um before I say something it's I mean I'm, I think there's a lot to think about with that and I just love the idea and I had not thought about that before that the vessel is this form that can take on so many different meanings and it's sort of um you know some of the other questions that will possibly be asked that idea of kind of 
the functionality, the spirituality, you know, what does it mean to be an open vessel that can't um, physically contain anything? Um, but I think that I love the idea of that understanding. We know what that form is and it allows us to um, really connect to the work and, and take that next meaning. You know, it's a safe, we understand that it's a safe way to enter that space and that thought process for the artist. Mm -hmm. I think that's really wonderful. Yeah, I was thinking, um, you know that you know that uh, you're working with good folks on the team when when they say something. In this case, uh, Nava said uh, said you know said that it opened up this thread about the um, idea of a vessel as an entry, and I was like, yes, that I meant to say that right. Um, <laughs> There's an incredible work in the museum by an artist named Kathy Gray that's called Forest Glass. I don't have a picture of it. I'm going to paint it for you. It's large scale. Um, and when you walk up to it, it's just every single cup you've ever held in your life. Uh, from the diner, from the thrift store, it's all the cups that you have held and that you've maybe owned. It's, you know, they're bumpy surfaces. They're white or white clear and green and maybe brownish. And when you back away, you see that they make these trees. And there's a whole history, glass dorky history that I could take you through, which I'm not going to do. But part of the reason I love this piece in the context of the galleries. Uh oh, holy cow. Katie is so fast. Look at you. So amazing. There you go. Uh, one of the things that I love about this piece is that our space is big and giant and white and intimidating. But, and, and many of our viewers have never even been to any other art museum before, let alone uh, thought about glass or any of these things. And they walk into this big intimidating space and they see these cups that they've held. And these cups do unlock all sorts of different things. They unlock this history of glass. They unlock a story about how glass is made. Um, but they do the things that everybody's been talking about tonight. You know, they are an object that everybody has a memory with, an association with. Uh, to bring it back to Emily's like really good question that I veered us away from uh, about <laughs> how culture is made and vessels being the beginning of culture. I mean, of course, right? Because culture starts with people. And, and starts with the family unit. And then it starts with other people. And you're, you know, it's not Christmas time. So you're not trying to kill them. You know, you're trying to feed them. You're trying to, or I don't know how it is in your family. <laughs> um, anyway, vessels do bring us together. They are an entry. They are an entry for artists to bring meaning into things. And they are an entry for our own selves uh, to, bring our, uh, to, bring, to bring meaning into spaces. Like walk into, uh, walking into Nava's show, I'm building it in my head. You know, to see, um, to see bowls, to see, to see shapes that I have a relationship with, that I know how they feel in my hand, even if they're as big as me, I know what that feels like. That's the power of a vessel. It, it, it implicates us entirely. It implicates us not only in our mind, but in our hands, maybe our stomachs. Mm. I, I love that idea of like the vessel lingering right? It lingers with us so that we encounter, when we encounter it even out of context, it's there. We've got that lingering vesselness that we carry with us. And I think that that brings me to this, um, you know, question that I, I want to ask about a narrative that's often used to talk about the impact of the advent of studio craft being a shift, right? So makers moving from creating functional forms, functional vessels, to non-functional artworks that might reference a vessel through material or form. We have this like binary, is the vessel functional? Is it non-functional? Um, vessels are vessels if they function, they're symbols if they don't. Um, I'm curious if you can each talk about that, uh, that sort of binary that, that artists are picking apart and playing with, um, its uses, its limitations, and how you think about it in the context of the work you do. Well, the moment you put a vessel in a museum collection, it becomes non-functional, unfortunately. Um, which I think is just kind of an interesting, you know, what we do, and we're talking about this functionality, but we kind of make everything not functional. Um, one of the pieces that I included an image is of a piece by Sarah Perkins called Shares, and it is um, a picture with 
um, kind of an endless number of cups with it. And so it's an interesting piece because it kind of, it, it certainly holds water. Each of the cups would hold liquid. Um, it could be shared. But when you see this piece, you can tell that there are more cups than what the pitcher can hold. Um, and there are more cups that have been made and purchased or passed on um, so that these cups are spread out all over the country. So in some ways, in, in and of itself, it's not functioning the way that it should. And then on top of that, um, all of the enamels are lead-based enamels. So it's not even functional as a cup, even though it does function. And so I, I love this piece because I thought it really played with that idea of even the question of what, what does it mean to be functional? Because on the flip side, you could say that a non-functioning vessel that has a spiritual aspect um, that provides meaning is, is functional, even if it cannot actually physically hold something. Susie, you look as though you're you're lifting out of your chair. <laughs> That's my listening, you? my listening tone. <laughs> I, I actually was very happy to let uh to like cruise along and um let <laughs> let other folks um answer because I have a punt on this one, you guys. Um, if you if you Katie could put up my second image if it's possible but if it's not possible it's okay no so you didn't get them it's fine i'll build it for everybody in their head i'll build it in the head um i think so many things you know fun functional vessel non-functional vessel i think largely the same thing i i think of like what ray Eam says about functioning decoration you know everything has a purpose and it has a meaning and it has a function whether it can hold water or not um and so the two images that I had, I will paint them for you, were um, pieces that were in my exhibition, New Glass Now. And one is by an incredibly talented, well, they're both by incredibly talented artists. One is Matt Saz. And it, um, it, it, it is, it is um, absolutely mind defying uh, because it looks like a basket. I mean, it is a basket, delicate basket, mostly negative space with this um, uh, delicate, glass looks like twine just um, in the air. And this thing um, doesn't function, right? But it it could, like, it's a little bit sharp. Like I think of it as, um, it, it, I displayed it next to a work by Jenny Kamari Martiniello, who is um, an Aboriginal Australian and she works in glass. And what she does is she translates pretty directly um, the traditional fishing baskets of her, of her tribe into glass. And so here was a, vessel that does hold water, um, looks like a basket, would be terrible at catching fish because the water doesn't go through. But Matt Saz's could catch the fish and maybe scale it at the same time because it's kind of sharp. So thinking mm -hmm. about um, where, uh, where function uh, comes in, I, I think there's really so, so, many, um, so many things there that it, that it can go with, but a punt nonetheless. <laughs> Not a, not a punt, that was- Not a punt, <laughs> right on target. <laughs> yeah. um, and it made me think of that idea of function as well. Before I loop back um, to if I even remember what the original question was, that um, function, what is function? And that, that fraught term, decorative arts. And I just always think, God, what is more decorative than a painting? What? who decided <laughs> who decided that a painting is not decorative art come on people um and that everything it, every artwork functions it functions in art as art it makes us think it is ornamented and makes us feel and sometimes it can also hold liquid um if katie if you don't mind pulling up my image just since um this idea of function and non-function with regard to the we were asked to put together some images and so I tried to imagine like what would I want to talk about if you're talking about the vessel and the first artist I think of is Magdalena Dundo who is an amazing um Kenyan English artist um she well she's Kenyan but she lives in England now she, she makes these sublime 
forms that defy that she has made them by her hands. They are so perfectly smooth and um, they are not thrown, they're hand built. Um, it, we had the honor of having her as a guest artist at the clay studio so I get to watch her making things. Um, they are strong, but sometimes you can just, if you don't mind, Katie, I just maybe go through them just so people can see the difference. Um, the Not to put, again, this emphasis that I was mentioning the connection between a vessel and the body. That was the other thing, the other reason. I mean, look at that one. That you just, it, there are these simple forms, but at the same time, they just so much, they just look like bodies. And of course you can put water in it, but they sell for $90,000. Um, sorry to be sort of, there was some capitalism in there. Would you put water in that? I wouldn't. <laughs> um, and they are based on her technique that she learned when she um, went to Nigeria to learn from women who um, were make. I mean, look at this one, speaking of pregnancy, geez, I peed. Um, so they're based on the ways that people have been making pots since before electric wheels and all of these things. They have this deep root in making something to put water in it, to, to carry it from one place to another. And yet they completely defy anyone to ever try putting water in them. <laughs> so um, I just love that idea that why they still are vessels while also denying the function and with just their graceful simplicity are, as far as I'm concerned, some of the highest art I could ever hope to see. Mm. Yeah. Um, Thank you, Katie. Well, I, I have a couple of things to add. Um, and um, first of all, uh, to, just thinking about the origin of this organization, which, which came out of a movement where people were taking a completely artisanship and production oriented technique and um, creating vessels, not with any intention whatsoever to use them, but as a technical challenge to who can make the thinnest walled vessel, who can make the tallest vessel, who can take the most challenging piece of wood and turn it into something smooth and, um, and harmonious in form. Um, and uh, so, you know, right there we have, we have a story um, and, and a, a a salute in a way or, or a nod to function just in terms of pure form um, and nothing else, no, no consideration what, whatsoever. And certainly the collectors um, and then consequently the museums who are collecting these objects never thought to put anything inside them at any point in time. Um, so, so starting right there as a basis for thought, but then um, in the exhibition we have, uh, I wanna, which one do I wanna talk about first? Um, Aaron Haba, I think, um, the, the whole idea of this piece came from um, Aaron's um, inspiration from reading uh, um, some lines by uh, the poet and founder of Taoism, Lao Tzu. Um, that's this one here. This is um, eight feet tall and 10 feet in diameter. Um, and those lines are shape clay into a vessel. It is the space within that makes it useful. Cut doors and windows for a room. It is the holes which make it useful. Therefore, benefit comes from what is there, but usefulness comes from what is not there. Um, and so I, I think that is really wonderful to think about when we see this piece here, because we, we instantly know it's not extremely, or it's not ornamented in any way. It's actually reclaimed timber from, um, from a church. And so it's interesting to, to, to think about transition from one spiritual vessel that's used to contain people joined in a, in a communal ritual um, in order to form another kind of um, spiritual container um, of a very different kind and a very different kind of practice and ritual. Um, so that is one. And then on the other end, there's um, a, a work that becomes pure ornament, which is Frank Cummings' 
um, nature and transition. It is, um, you know, a, a, an extremely virtuoso piece of um, wood turning. It's cork, actually, um, cork oak, and um, but it's been embellished with ivory and eighteen karat gold, and its grain itself is ornament, and so um, and it's it's extremely precious. It's about this this size. So we're going from something that's ten feet in diameter to something that is. Um, six inches in diameter, um, but but the preciousness of um, one against the hospitability and the and the universal cosmic um, invitation of the other is um, can kind of I don't know should demonstrate the stretch of divide when we at, when we think about um, vessels in wood and function. Well, I think we've got a remarkable span here. Um, I want to make sure that we have time for audience questions. So, so we can open it up if you'd like to put a question in the chat. And if not, I will ask these folks more questions of my own. <laughs> Do you have any questions from folks who are here tonight? And perhaps while we're waiting, I can, I can ask you, um, Something a little more personal. Is there a vessel that you have in your home that's meaningful to you? And, you know, as a sort of coda, how is its meaning different from those that you care for in the collections that you steward? Dumper. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I I'll, bonus points for props if you have them. <laughs> um, actually, the necklace I'm wearing is a vessel and um, something that's really important to me. And um, its function will change over time, but it actually holds a hundred dollar bill that was given to me by um, someone who wanted to help me raise. It was so, sort of the um, starting point of raising money for our capital campaign. And, you know, she handed me this hundred dollar bill and I didn't know what to do with it and I couldn't lose it because that seemed like a horrible thing to do. And so I had a friend who is a jeweler make this for me. So it's sort of a, I mean, it's a vessel. It has its own meaning, um, but who knows what its meaning will be at the end of the campaign. Do I open it up and give that hundred dollar bill to the museum? Um, do I give it to the museum? It's sort of a question of what it becomes then, but it's sort of this very special piece that in this moment um, is sort of always by my side. So a different type of vessel in jewelry. That's lovely. All right, well, I took this out of my right front behind me. This is a um, a jar that I asked, I had commissioned and it it says Harrison, oh, it's backwards, sorry. This is a tooth. Oh. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Harry's teeth are in there. So it's also um, interesting because on Designing Motherhood's uh, Instagram the other day, they actually asked if you have your child's teeth, they want pictures of them because they ask people what they, what they do with them. So, I mean, this is by Aaron Kim, who was a resident hours. at the Clay Studio. Uh, people are um, I can't oh, see, you can't see it. Ruth and Rick are holding something up. It's very hard for you to see it probably, but it's yeah. an old Shipibu pot from Bermuda. Peru. Bermuda. And it is from the Eyes Gallery. We have several of them mm -hmm. and it's a treasure. Lovely. We're sitting in the room with, with, with a bunch of treasures. <laughs> I love this. I should have. We should have asked everybody to bring their favorite vessel to show at the end. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's convenient. Susie has something. Oh no! Yeah. But I don't have a good. I don't have a good favorite vessel, you guys. It's a stumper. I have too many that I really like, um, and uh, nothing is good as either of those. Um, but I did have one thing that I felt like I would be remiss if I didn't say, 
about glass vessels. Am I allowed to do that now, or do you want me to wait? You are, yeah. you are. And, well, and I'll just remind, well, Susie yeah. says this, if people have questions, put them in the chat. This is that time too. But Susie, oh. yes, please. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, one of the things that's so especially cool about vessels in glass is that they are so often, if they're blown, they're formed by breath. And so they have the literally in their making are carrying are carrying the breath of the blower. And then that is an incredible thing that goes into um, what ends up being there. So then, you know, the breath is released when the piece goes from the blowpipe to the punty and the vessel is opened, but it's um, carried something even in that moment. And I think that is, um, a particular gift of glass to the language of vessels and to the meanings of vessels and the vessel and the body. Um, so I felt like if I didn't give the shout out to the material, then I wouldn't have done my job tonight. So I think I think that's beautiful. And I think if anyone else would like to answer the question about a personal vessel or talk about the material of that they work with, what it brings to this language. Although I see we looks like we have a hand raised for Linda. Hi there. So Hi, I, I, everybody. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm a fiber artist, and um, this has been a wonderful discussion. So much, um, many good um, expressions and uh, thoughts for me to reflect on. Um, I made a vessel uh, for um, out of twine. So when you think about containment and whether how how something holds something. You know, twine can't really hold a liquid, but for me, it is a symbol of. Um, it's a, it's a symbol in many ways of who we are as individuals. We are vessels, and um, I love this. Um, you know how fiber is a symbol of many things. Um, this particular vessel is uh, made out of hemp twine. And I made it for the Charleston Nine, for those who were murdered. Um, and the vessel um, is includes seeds, um, wood, and actually some lynch knots. And um, it was my way of memorializing them. And um, because it's made out of organic materials, I often think about how this is uh, a way for their life to go on in some some new fashion but as I said there are seeds so these are seeds here these um the dotted things are seeds so that's my vessel um but again this has been a really lovely conversation thank you I see a, a note here from from Todd in the chat and thank you Linda for sharing um about a nest being clearly a vessel and, and learning the word nest comes from the root meaning as a, a chair and thinking about connections between vessels and furniture. Does anyone, anyone have any thoughts about that link, which is, or any thoughts about that link that we can, we can adequately get into in the time that we have, because I think they're plentiful. I was thinking about um, Linda's a wonderful comment that, of course, clothing is another vessel. Mm. And, and anyway, but I'll let the furniture thing happen. <laughs> no, I think I think the takeaway that we might have from tonight is what is not a vessel in some way, shape, or form. Mm. Yeah. Oh, if not metaphorically. <laughs> if not, yeah. <laughs> I'm looking. I I think Danielle Rosebird is here, and I just wanted to give a shout to Danielle. This is a carved. Um, piece that sits on my desk here um, that she, I don't know if you can see the detail, but everything that she does is hand carved um, and um, it has beautiful texture and color. And I love that it sits right here, um, not necessarily carrying anything. I don't know, it's not furniture. It has nothing to do with um, what we're supposed to be talking right now. So I don't really do that part of the assignment at the moment. Um, but I did, <laughs> I was thinking about when, when the mention of nest came up, I was thinking about this work of uh, from the Atipovara 
movement that was actually, um, it was made by an Italian artist whose name I can never ever remember, but it's an actual person sized nest made out of um, like, it's basically like an enormous bowl cushion with pillow eggs inside. And I saw it in a gallery at the downtown gallery in Paris some years ago. And I was just entranced by this idea that, that you could um, purchase a piece of high-end design furniture that is essentially a very, very comfort um, a sort of an anti antidote to the anxiety piece. Um, and whether you think of that as that vessel in its in its um, more literal presentation or as like a, an adult sized womb for all intents and purposes, which is the same thing, um, it, it immediately came to mind. Well, and speaking of that year, the image that comes up when you turn your camera off of course, is you in the womb chair, right? Hey, Donald Pesce. Oh, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Well, here it is, folks. See, there we go. It's all back to the top. <laughs> and, and, and the idea of Pesce was to create a chair that could envelop you like a womb. It was meant to be extremely um, women-formed. Um, and if you know Gaetano Pesce, he was not ashamed to um, think about things as explicitly as he does that's I want to call out yeah before we close tonight I just want to call out Michelle's comment here about the vessel as an object with limitless potential with which is what I think we really that's if we've come to any conclusion tonight that's the conclusion that we've come to right that this is a form that um can hold so much can give so much um I want to thank everyone for being here tonight. I want to thank the center for having all of us. I hope that you host a vessel show and tell sometime in the future, because wouldn't that be fun? We kind of had our impromptu one tonight. <laughs> um, I'm so, what did you say? Traveling vessels in different materials. It's, it's happening. There we go. <laughs> And I want to just hand it back over to, I want to thank our panelists and hand it back over to Katie in case there's anything that the center needs to say at the close of our conversation tonight. Thank you, Emily. I, I want to thank all of our panelists. This was a, a, a fantastic conversation and um, my mind is, <laughs> it's just flashing all over the place right now, thinking about vessels and, and what everybody has said. So I'm probably going to be doing some writing tonight thinking about that. Um, I want to invite everybody to come visit our exhibition uh, before it closes February 12th. I did put that in the chat again. Um, we're looking forward to um, seeing you in person and seeing you at our next, ex uh, next event, which um, will be taking place on February 5th. And I did not pull that link, so I apologize. Um, thank you, Emily, for everything that you did tonight. Your questions were magnificent. <laughs> well, if everybody wants they to have magnificent answers. So I'm it panels is only good as this panelist, and, and you guys were fabulous. <laughs> yeah. So um, anyways, everybody be safe, um, be kind, and we'll see you soon. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Emily. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Thank you, nice JC. Thank you, Susie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much, Katie. Thank you. Yes. It's really Bye. lovely. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye.